and it says we're live. So, hey, you, greetings, everybody. Uh, we're still at the pre-show, but we're a fig repeat here with Hoover. Sticks is in the background doing production work tonight. We're grateful to him for that. And we're about to take this whole thing into the live mode. Um, you all prepped in mind with uh, the t in in. I lost my. Don't get tired. It's bad for your I'm, memory. I'm, I'm the, ready. The in the in story teaser. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who's doing the intro Good. repeat and who is? Uh, okay, so do? yeah, let's go Hoover, and then uh, he he'll do the intro teaser. Then why yeah. don't you pick it up, hand it to me, and I'll Got pick it. it back as an intro. All team. right, let's go. Okay, Hoover fig repeat. Here we go. I need to zero out my timer. Hack. I'm making sure it's zeroed. Hack. Making sure of it. Hack. It didn't zero. Uh, For the fuck's sake, know, man. man. Right? It's not zeroing. Why is it not doing? Okay. Well, I'm going to have to go with three and a half hours, which is going to be perfect. Hack. And here we go. Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. This here is a true story about crossing the pond at night in the world's smallest cockpit Airy. on the tanker through the weather oh and to the uh, tanker crew who uh, did that thanks a lot we really appreciated that I'm just kidding no I'm not There I was crossing the pond, and you could see that I wasn't exactly fun. So there I was, an Air Force guy, finding myself walking out on the carrier deck and being told, go find your aircraft <laughs> and go take off. I'm thinking to myself, what the hell have I gotten myself into? <laughs> well, that is a great... <laughs> so there I was, opener. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Fig coming to you from... Well, hell, I'm in Denver, Colorado today. Where's my co-host? Repeat. Greetings, Hello. everyone. Repeat here, coming to you live from India, no place, Indiana, Indianapolis. So, and that is the voice you heard of. Some of you may recognize his voice from his channel, which is Pilot Debrief on YouTube. Uh, call sign Hoover, one of the few Air Force... Uh, eagle drivers to carrier qualify and fly hornets with the marine corps welcome hoover we're thrilled that you could join us tonight and up front thank you for being so flexible with our screwed up schedules yes thanks hoover <laughs> i'm glad to be a part of this <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah, i would no, i, I want to go i want to get the rest of that but uh, we we'll, we'll get to that because uh you know i i yeah. knew your background but that's that's pretty awesome actually that's really awesome indeed so how uh, so um but but how'd you get started we, yes. we always have to start at the beginning how'd you get started flying what was uh what was it that piqued your interest in airplanes and and how'd you get there from here well so when i was a kid i always wanted to be an astronaut and then i found okay. out you have to do more advanced math to, to figure out how to do that stuff <laughs> there's the rub uh, right so there. Hey. You know, eventually made my way off to uh to the air force academy and and that's where you know i got about through uh, freshman year of uh trying to do calculus and said, all right, that's, that's enough. <laughs> and I, I tapped out of that and said, well, I guess we'll just, we'll just stick with the regular flying instead of pursuing that engineering uh, degree and doing everything else that you need to, to become a test pilot and go down that path. So, um, but yeah, I mean, back when I was a kid, I used to always just draw pictures of the shuttle and, you know, had always had that sort of interest, but no one in my family ever served in the military. And, and we lived in Tampa and we'd go down to the air shows at, at McDill air force base there uh, and see, you know, okay. the aircraft down there. And so that, that kind of got me started on that path. And Sounds not far familiar. from the launches. Did you ever go to a launch? Uh, no, but you could actually, you could see them, uh, from, uh, from where we were, you know, across the state there. And I still remember right. being, I think I was in, is either third or fourth grade, uh, going outside and then watching the challenger, uh, you know, oh, break yeah. apart. Oh, uh, so that's something I'll, I'll never forget, you know, and like, and as elementary school kids, like you're kind of like, you don't really understand what's happening until, you know, right. years later, uh, the, the gravity of the situation. 
Um, but um, yeah, that's something I'll I'll never forget seeing that happen live. Right. That's that's one of those moments in American history where people know exactly where they were. So where were you, repeat? <clears throat> I was driving through the back gate at Cherry Point. I was a firing platoon commander in the Hawk Missile Battery, and uh, was uh, it was I was on my way back from uh, back from uh, a morning break. I think I'd been out PT or something. For some reason, I was at the house and I was on my way back to the, to the uh, to the battalion and heard it on the radio as I was driving through the gate. So it was uh, horrendous. How about you? I was. Uh walking through the student union in uh, college my senior year and it's all happened live on the uh, big yeah. screen there and yeah i was like oh shit that's not good terrible right one of the reasons i asked you about had you gone to the had you ever gone to a launch uh, I, I did have the privilege of going to a launch many years later a friend of mine uh, uh, another one uh was uh, on columbia and uh, we okay. went down to that launch three miles away the the deep resonance of the thumping that was going through my chest as that thing was was lifting off the pad and, and going into outer space was one of the yeah. most impressive demonstrations of, of man man made power I've ever seen in my life heretofore. So anyway, well, happy times. What hey. a great subject yeah. to start off. So so I uh, obviously I heard yeah. I heard uh, I heard you say uh, Air Force Academy Hoover. Um, yeah. Uh, and then uh, their pilot training, and uh, obviously you went the fighter route. Yeah. Uh, so, later. well, so uh, you know, after the after the academy, uh, I ended up doing a year on casual status, uh, waiting to go to pilot training. Uh, oh shit! Like over in uh, Ramstein, uh, where I flew yeah. with the C nine squadron, which was probably one of the greatest assignments <laughs> that I ever had. You know, <laughs> young second lieutenant with no responsibility, and here you're gonna you know, you don't, you don't need to be qualified on the aircraft. We just need you to go along with us and you can work the oven and cook the meals, <laughs> you know, uh, that's did you thing. bounced around Europe in the C9? Yeah. Yeah. So we went all oh, over the place. So they do all the, uh, the, uh, the air medical evacuation stuff. Um, so during the time I was there, the, the biggest thing they responded to was the USS coal, uh, bombing. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, you know, I, obviously I, I didn't go on that mission cause being a non, you know, working crew member or whatever, but, um, right. uh, they, they have pretty big mission set over there with standard routes, you know, to, uh, Sigonella and Aviano and over to Inserlick and stuff like that. So yeah. it, it was so a good would have been fall of 2001, huh? Mm -hmm. September. Wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 So that was, that was a good exposure, you know, coming out of the air force Academy to what a flying squadron was like, um, on the, uh, at least on the non-fighter side. And then off I went to pilot training. And then, like you said, I ended up I initially, to be honest, I, I wanted to fly helicopters because uh, I just thought that was kind of cool. But I think I was also <laughs> probably being heavily influenced by the fact Sticks that. Sticks giving the high sign in the background Sticks, here. Right? Sticks is in the background <laughs> doing push ups. And I don't know. He's going crazy. That's awesome. <laughs> so we had, we had um, two of my T 37 instructors were uh, MH 53 guys. That, that did all you know the spec ops stuff and so they had all these all these cool stories that they would tell us and I'm like man this this sounds really awesome i should maybe go do that because that sounded a lot funner than you know flying around in, in a <laughs> in a c9 um <laughs> well, and uh yeah. eventually you know about half halfway through the the uh the t37 training I, I had some friends that were over flying the t38s on the fighter track and uh and they were like no nah, man this is way cooler come do this and so so that's the direction i went and then Got a very fortunate enough to, you know, pick up a, a strike eagle slot, and then that's how I got started. Awesome. Uh, nice. Well, what it, a beast so, that airplane is, too. Huh? Yeah. The strike eagle. I don't. Okay, Fig, right. do you remember the first time you saw an eagle? Yeah, I up do. close. I uh, well, you mean air to air? Uh, you mean like yeah, well, no, it, just it, it, walking it, around. The first time I ever saw one on the ramp was uh, I was actually at Fatima at the air show out on uh, oh, uh dude yes i was there with you yeah we were there together. oh so, yeah okay yeah walked <laughs> yes, up and yes, i'm like yes. oh my god that's a monster airplane i had I you know. know i had no idea how big the eagle was it was like, like a oh, 14 geez, size no striking I mean, yeah you know, it was like as big as a tennis court practically yeah yeah so that's that's cool um but you didn't have any fun flying that did you no probably not <laughs> 
<laughs> no, that was, a, that was a blast. That first assignment was, uh, I mean, everybody remembers their first assignment, you know, uh, sure. the, the friendships that you make and you kind of going through that whole process, you know, becoming part of a fighter squadron and, and deployments and things like that. And so, right. um, so yeah, it was Where's the training for that. Uh, Seymour Johnson, North uh-huh. Carolina. Okay. And then did you okay. stay there or, or where, where were you based in your first? Uh, so I, I started there and then the second assignment was the uh, Hornet exchange assignment that I did. And then I ended up after that, I went back to the strike Eagle uh, before they finally decided that was enough flight time for me and I need to go to school and oh, learn geez. how to be a, an officer or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so right. I did that for a little bit. Sticks in the mud. So you, in your first tour, uh, how long, how long did you get to fly in your first squadron? Uh, I left that first assignment with just over a thousand hours, uh, in the strike about three, over, three years over, time or over that three year period. Yeah. Oh, wow. Damn. Well, you, you've, you're getting a lot of, that's good flying. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a lot of, a lot of, well, two of the, we did two combat deployments during that time. And so there okay. was a lot of, um, close air support, you know, and we were flying out, out of cutter, up into Iraq, you know, and so those were, yeah, you know, usually like six, eight hour missions, um, you know, so, so you build, oh, yeah. you build up the hours pretty quick. I'm trying to think, I don't think, I don't think there were F-15 E's there when I was there in 25th. What, when, when were you there? Uh, what, what years, uh, uh, what, what years was your first deployment? First, your first deployment two? was in 04. Okay. And, and then the second one was in the spring of 06. Wow. That's pretty quick turnaround time for you guys. Yeah. But back, back then we weren't, so the air force, you know, they eventually went to the whole six month deployment thing, but back then we were only doing, you know, the 90 to 120 day. Oh, wow. Uh, Even active duty guys were doing that time. Yeah. Yeah. So that wasn't, that's a good deal. So so it wasn't bad. (laughs) No, no, that's outstanding. That's outstanding. Go ahead, brother. I was just going to ask. So how much time did you wind up uh, total in uh, the Eagle in the Hornet? When, uh, uh, when it was all said, my, my total flight time over the military is just, I think, a little over 2,000 hours, like 22, 2300, something like nice. that. Yeah. You know, I, I ended up having, you know, I, I didn't get a lot of time in the Hornet, um, which you might not be <laughs> surprised, but, you know, maintenance is, is not as <laughs> the same kind of uh, standard that they do in the Air Force, and the funding is, isn't the best. Um, but then, um, you know, it was, after that third flying assignment, going to school and then doing a staff job. And then, you know, and then I ended up doing a remote over to Korea. So I ended up out of the cockpit for about five years Oh, geez. Uh, dur- during that my hurts. 20 year timeline. So yeah, that was, it was painful. <laughs> <laughs> that, Watching airplanes fly going, I know how no, to do that's that. Rough. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, I want to back up just a second, Hoover. Um, yeah. yeah. When you're in flight school, uh, T-37s and T-38s and then the, um, what, what, what do you guys call the the blue uh, the blue T thirty eights the um, the um, or maybe maybe that's changed so once you, once you got yeah so well, the, let, let me get straight to the point yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> was there any excitement uh, in flight training that you, would, sticks in your mind like oh shit I remember this one time so there was this one time so there I was I mean do you have any of those in flight training I, I do <laughs> they're not. Uh, <laughs> They're not, uh, I would say, flying related. Um, that's but, okay. Uh, but but I'll, I'll, that's <laughs> I'll okay. share one story because I because I did get kicked out of pilot training for about uh, uh, about a period of about oh. twelve to eighteen hours. <laughs> okay, ooh, ooh, so ooh, this ooh, is ooh. worth a stag. Okay, there, I, yeah. I, I so there may be a, a show title there. I did get kicked out of flight training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is I was when I was doing the T thirty eight thing. I was the class leader because uh, I was I was the highest ranking uh, guy in the class at the time, and so we had a trip that we were supposed to go on up to the uh, the centrifuge to to do that stuff, you know, and then uh, and then come back and it was over the weekend, and so we we drove up there as a as a class. I think we had like a government van or something, but anyways, we kind of you know. I won't talk about what happened while we were on that trip. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> but uh, but I will say that that when we came back, we we had some other we had some stuff with us that we acquired along the way from some various places that we frequented while we were there. Ah. And um, there you, know, you go. As, as we're pulling back into the parking lot, as we're getting close to the base. I got this phone call, uh, and it was from the uh, the flight commander, and 
you know, hey, hey, how'd the, how'd the trip go? You know, you guys heard you're coming back, you know, this afternoon. I said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, we'll, we'll great. be back a couple yeah. hours. So, okay, great, because the uh, the squadron commander would like to see you in his office as soon as you get back. You know, don't don't bother going to your door. Mm -hmm. just, um, just come straight in and report into his office. This is like a Sunday afternoon. Uh, I'm like, okay, that's not thinking good. like, well, well, what did what did the guys in the other van do that, that I don't know about yeah. that, that I'm about to find out uh, when I walk into the boss's he, office? He's not hanging in his office on a Sunday night afternoon for grins. No. Yeah, well, and, and, and I kind of asked that question. It was like, is there anything I should be concerned? Oh, no, no, he just wants to chat, <laughs> you know. Sure he does. You know, of, of course, you know, it's not really what, <laughs> what that meeting's going to be about. So, um, Brutal. I, and I, I'll never forget, you know, uh, just kind of, we, we pulled into the parking lot and I, I told my buddies, I was like, all right, I, I got to walk into the office. You guys take whatever's in these vans. I don't want to know about it and <laughs> get it out of here, go on your way. And I'm going to have plausible deniability, uh, over this whole thing. These aren't you know? the and, and, Cause that's what I, I thought it was about. You know, maybe the guys did something, uh, you know, on the trip that I wasn't aware of. And I walk into that office there and he's got the lights off. And he's sitting there in the dark behind his desk and there's like oh, the glow of the computer screen on his face, you know, oh. and, you know, kind of, you know, half, half, like, should I report in or should I just, you right. know, what should I do, you know, oh. and I uh, walk in there and, and he just, he doesn't want me to sit down. He's like, stand right here. You know, it's like, I, and then he starts off this, you know, like, I just want to let you know how utterly disgusted I am right now. And he says, as of this moment, you are no longer in pilot training <laughs> and I need you to go back to your dorm room. You're going to find a letter from the OSI, which is the office of special investigations. Right. For those who don't know, uh, so you're going to, you're going to find a letter from the OSI. They've confiscated some things from your room, including your computer. And, uh, you know, there'll be instructions in that letter for what you're supposed to do. And, and we'll go from there. But but we're done talking, and you can go ahead and leave now. <laughs> See, so he did just want to chat, and you listen. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, this this sounds this sounds more uh, treacherous than just some small yeah, antics. Yeah, so I, right. I'm thinking like, well, what, what in the is... world is going on? So I, right. I I called my buddy at the dorm who lived across the hall from me. I'm like, hey man, did, did anybody come by my room this weekend? He's like, no. What are you What are you talking about? I'm like. Okay, so I make my way over there, and um, I open my door, and everything's in place. My computer's there. There's no letter, and I'm and I'm like dumbfounded. I'm like, I don't know what to do now. You know, are you getting punked? Are you and, thinking uh, well, there's got to be a mistake at this point, right? Yeah. yeah. So I call I call my flight commander, uh, who was the one that originally called me, told me about the the meeting, and and I said, hey boss, you know, like I I went and I, I met with with the boss and he told me I was kicked out and there's stuff in my room and stuff missing, but I came back to my room. There's nothing here. There's no letter. I don't know what's going on. You know, what am I supposed to do? And then I get the hold on, I'll be right over I'm like, Oh crap. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so now he's, he's coming over. He gets there. He kind of walks up to my, my room, looks around. He's like, all right, I'll be back. And then he takes off Okay. and doesn't, doesn't, explain to me what's going on. So I'm just kind of left yeah. standing there. So is he a major Lieutenant Colonel? He, he's a, he's a captain. The squadron okay. commander was the Lieutenant Colonel. So no fire. Okay. Um, and to, to make a long story short, you know, a few, a few minutes later, you know, he shows back up in the parking lot. He's like, All right. I talked to the squadron commander here. You need to talk to him. And he like puts me on the phone with him. And squadron commander is like, he's, he says, what's, I forget, I forget his, his exact words, but it was something like, what's your first name? <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's like, more than one of you. Up to, this less... point, up, up to this point, and, and I'm not going to say, but up to this point, I was just Lieutenant, you know, so-and-so, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, you know, John and, Doe, you're Lieutenant <laughs> Doe. It, it turns out, turns out there's a lot of Joneses or Smiths or, you know, whatever. Right. Yes. Okay. And so, so I tell him my first name he's all right, I'll, I'll call you back few minutes more goes by he calls back all right disregard everything i said <laughs> you know you're gonna show up tomorrow and we'll figure out the paperwork you know and, and we're gonna go from there and and that was the end of it and it was still sunday afternoon 
you know, and, and I, so I guess they had already done up some paperwork because the next day when I came in, like I had to sign some forms and do some stuff. And then, uh, it was probably about, uh, later that afternoon where the wing commander, so the guy in charge of the base, the 06, uh, wanted to meet with me and apologize <laughs> on behalf of everybody. Uh, as it turns out, there was another Lieutenant who had the same uh. last name as me. Uh, who had been involved in some what, fairly nefarious things. Yeah, apparently. let's just say it's just extremely inappropriate <laughs> <laughs> type of activities uh, that would have been on his computer. Um, oh, boy. Okay. You know? And so oh. that was, I mean, it was one of the scariest moments I had in pilot training that didn't have to do with flying, <laughs> yeah. thankfully. Well, that's that's you, uh, totally you know? understandable. Wow. Um, yeah, so I was I was kicked out, and then the the funny thing was that wing commander he ended up being the uh, the wing commander at Seymour uh, Johnson while I was there, <laughs> and so I got to run into him again, uh, and, and I remember I was uh, I had a few few too many drinks at the O Club when I did, and I said, hey, you remember me? I was that guy you got kicked out. <laughs> you kicked me out for eighteen hours. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's a story with a happy ending, and I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. But, and who but, needs laxatives when you get a chat like that? From <laughs> well, you know, and I, and I, oh my story, God. like, I feel like, you know, my entire flying career, I was just extremely fortunate that I never found myself in any type of, you know, situation where I felt, you know, really unsafe or had some sort of complex emergency that the closest thing I had to a complex emergency was we had a, um, uh, an AMAD fire, uh, you know, it's a, uh, airframe mounted accessory drive, you know, that connects the okay. generator and the engine yeah. uh, or whatever. And then the strike could go. So we had, we had one of those fires, but it happened after like a seven hour mission over in Iraq and we had landed and we had, you know, taxi back in and we were about to shut down on the trucks when the thing lit off. Oh, you know? <laughs> and so the timing yeah. of it just happened to work, work out. Like it was the best timing possible <laughs> for something, for something to catch on fire, you know? Um, and it was, right. it was actually a pretty good size uh, fire. <laughs> But, uh, yeah. well, it's a good yeah. place to have it in the chalks, you know, yeah, but, I mean, other than exactly. that, you know, you, you, you talked to all these guys that, you know, uh, live through, you know, some, some pretty crazy stuff or right. had really weird things happen to them. And, and like I said, I, I think it was just very fortunate. So a lot of my flying stories aren't necessarily flying stories. They were just kind of crazy stuff that happened over the years. <laughs> yeah, that was, you know, uh, most of my stories uh, that I tell are, not really flying related there they have <laughs> they're in off-duty hours let's just put it that well, way there's yeah, that, as, long, as, well, as long as only 10 percent is true you're good you yeah know. right <laughs> yeah and it is uh that's right yeah and as gallo put it there's uh, every there's plenty of good war stories ruined by an eyewitness so that's right that's right <laughs> So, um, wow. And so it lit off in Iraq. That reminds me, a friend of mine was a uh, Massachusetts Guard, uh, National Guard, did a pump over in Iraq. And he said, uh, talking about being there in the summer. And he goes, well, you ever walk through jet exhaust? I go, yeah. He goes, well, in Iraq, it actually cools you down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. So I see the fire lighting off, uh, you know. It's so, gotta be so, expected, but uh, all right, Hoover. Uh, you uh, you have a call sign Hoover. How how'd that come about? And, and is it vacuum related? It is not vacuum related. Okay. okay. Uh, and and the other question I get is if it's well, there's two other questions. I'm either somehow related to Bob Hoover, right? You know, uh, or it has something to do with Animal House. Uh, oh, right, right. And, and so it's so, it's and it's none of those. Well, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no eyewitnesses here, man. Make it sexy. <laughs> so, so, well, the, you know, so the story, as the story goes, um, you know, at, at, at Seymour, I, I did, you know, the initial training, the strike Eagle, and they have four squadrons there. You got two training units and then two operational squadrons. And since I was stationed there, you just kind of walk across the street to your operational squadron, bring all your flight gear with you. And, so at some point when I dropped off my flight gear, it got mixed up with somebody else's. Right. Uh, so when I went into, uh, to the life support shop to do that initial, uh, fit check on everything, went to put on my G suit and it had been maybe like a month, you know, cause they kind of give you some time off after training. Yeah. Um, I went in and like the G suit was just, you know, probably about five sizes way too big. And, you know, so the, the, the tech, he's sitting there trying to like cinch it down and he's like, like, sir, this is like, I can't, 
you know, this, this thing's way too big. We're going to, we're going to have to get a smaller size. And then, you know, and then this starts into the joke of like, you know, cause like I'm a, I'm a pretty skinny guy. And back, back then I was a little bit skinnier, <laughs> you know, oh, and so he's, he's like, well, what he's, happened he's to you, dude? Right. What's that? What is he like, dude, did you get a tapeworm in the last month? What happened to you? <laughs> well, so, so that starts in his joke of, you know, like, well, sir, like, I, I don't know if they make uh, a male G suit this small. We're going to have to get a, a female G suit. <laughs> you know? And so that's not good. And so, it, it, and then this turns it, you know, which, which there's no such thing. It's just all, you know, G suit, G suit, whatever. And then, um, but there was a, a female in the squadron who happened to be in there at the time and she had overheard all this. Oh boy. And so she, you know, as, as clever and as funny as most fighter pilots are, you know, decided that she would go around the squadron saying like, Hey, that new guy that just showed up, did you hear he wears a uh, female G or female flight suits because he likes the way they're form fitting, you know? So, so he's, he's actually, a cross, he's actually a cross dresser. <laughs> and so, so, and th so this rich. went on for a while because like back, you know, this was like 20 years ago. So people didn't really talk about that stuff, you know? Uh, yeah. And so, People, you know, so I get these weird looks sometimes from people in the squadron because, like, you could tell they were thinking it, but they didn't want to say anything or ask me about it, you know. <laughs> and and then eventually, like, pe people started asking me. They were like, "Who's going to ask him?" You know. And then somebody would ask me, like, "Hey, man, like, I, I heard you wear female flight suits. Like, what's the deal with that? You know? Like, does that does the zipper go all the way around, or like, how, how does that look? <laughs> you know?" <laughs> and so. So, no, no. Like, where, where are you guys hearing this? So, you know, like, no, like I don't wear chick flight suits, you know, like yeah, what, what the hell? And so, so that went on for, for a little while. And then, you know, of course we ended up, um, they wanted to wait until we did the naming until we were on a, a deployment. And so we go on the de deployment and, uh, unfortunately some things happened on that deployment that l made it turn out to be a dry deployment, uh, where they took away all the booze from us. Uh, so the naming <sighs> wasn't as creative as it could have been but but we had this story about you know here's this guy he was he's potentially a cross dresser and so uh somebody said well hey j edgar hoover was a cross dresser and nobody oh no, there you go okay so, that, so that's where hoover came from that's okay. well you know what i guess it could have been a lot worse <laughs> I could have been a lot. <laughs> that's a great story thank you that is yeah. actually really good yeah, yeah. that's it i'll tell you what yeah. i was there for a second and i got about 100 crunches worth of laughing in right there so i appreciate that <laughs> well you know the, the thing about about Beautiful. fighter pilots is, as you guys know is is as long as you tell something with a, with a certain air of credibility you know oh yeah and, and you're you know, yeah. as long as you make it believe, people believe you. They're like, yeah, like that, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, so, so and she was, she was really good about convincing people. Yeah. Yeah. So what's with the zipper? Does it go all the way around or what? What's the deal? That's, <laughs> that's rich. Oh man, that's awesome. Okay. So, so, you know, so no, no drama, no air drama, no, nothing, uh, no good combat stories from your first uh, couple pumps over there or, uh, um, you know, anything we, memorable? Oh yeah, yeah. We, so the first deployment we were over there um, it was actually no, it was actually the second deployment. But the, um, I mean, most of the time we were over there, it would it ended up being you know kind of slow because uh, you know OIF it would kind of come and go in waves uh, for, depending right. on what, what the guys on the ground were doing, and you know if your timing was off as a squadron, you know that there wasn't a lot going on. Um, but um, one of the times uh, we were over there, I, I was a, a flight lead. Uh, and so we were taking the formation up. We we're supposed to do our standard, you know, uh, what they call it, um, uh, recce or, or um, what's it called? <laughs> uh, route, uh, convoy support, you know, okay. scanning the route in front of the convoy. Sure. Right? In middle, okay. In the middle, in the middle of the night. And you're not working with somebody in the convoy. You're working with somebody back in the talk, you know, who's, who's talking on HF or something else with somebody else on the convoy. So, you know, so third party relay type stuff. Yeah. How could, how could that not get? screwed well up, right well and the thing is like you know the, these type of missions really what it was is you know they wanted us on call in case you know troop and, troops in contact or something yeah. kicked off and so they they'd assign us to cover these convoys just to give us something to do because there wasn't anything else for us to do there weren't there weren't any enough missions going on and you know it's one of these things okay well we want you to scan out in front of the um in front of the convoy we want you to you know 
tell us if you see any bad guys out there, you know, type of thing, you know, yeah. and you never find anybody, but, uh, but sure enough, flying along two o'clock in the morning or whatever, you know, my Wizzo is like, I got something, I got something, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden the excitement kicks off and he, uh, he found a guy on the side of the road. Uh, it was around the bend from where the convoy was headed. And you could tell that, you know, with the MVGs, you can kind of see some of the convoy lights and stuff. But as soon as the convoy kind of came around the corner, that guy, we, we watched him in the targeting pod. He dropped everything that he was doing. He was digging something on the side of the road and he dropped it. And he not only did he run across the street, but he jumped in a ditch. We had like a little stream and he swam across that. And then he got into the field and then he started running again. And we're like, okay, okay. like that's not, <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's normal. not normal. No, you know, two o'clock in the morning, you know, so, <laughs> uh, so we had to wait for the, uh, the process of, you know, relaying, to to try to get the convoy to stop so we're screaming at the you know uh, at the guy on the radio trying to get him to yell at the convoy to stop um eventually get the convoy to stop and then now this starts this you know this long process of okay well now we got to verify what it is while at the same time keeping track of this guy as he's going through the field so we can satisfy the rules of engagement making sure we have 100 percent uh positive id of him from from the time we found him all the way uh, up until that point. And as we're doing that, we're waiting for somebody from the convoy now to walk out in front to see what it was. And sure enough, oh, he had been geez. playing an IED, try, trying to ambush those guys. Um, and so, in of course, in the middle of all that, I'm having to coordinate, you know, for a refueling, uh, asset to come in, you know, to give us some more gas. And, and of course there's weather, you know, so we're dealing with that too and trying to, trying to figure that out. Um, and, but it worked out and, uh, eventually, uh, to much, much to my surprise, they eventually gave us authorization, uh, to, to strike. Cause at that point, like the ROE in the theater was starting to change. It was getting, becoming more conservative, yes. you know, where like, okay, well, if you're not actually being shot at, then we're not going to let you shoot back at somebody, oh. you know? Okay. Um, but, uh, but they, they did, they let us. And so we were able to, to, to take care of the threat that that was no longer a threat at the time, but definitely would have been a threat in the future. This sounds sure. like a, a process that was not expedient. Could you just no. guess at the timeline from the, the initial <sighs> contact with this, you saw this person until they actually went kinetic. It, it was long enough where I sent my wingman off to the tanker because I knew we were going to have to do um, what we call yo-yo oh. ops, which for those that don't know, you know, you, you got you're on your, your own. You're, over there is a two ship. So you send one jet to the tanker. So that way when he comes back, you can go. So that way you're always leaving one jet on station to provide the nice. coverage. So it was long enough for, for me, for me to coordinate for a tanker and then for me to send my wingman to the tanker for him to refuel and then come back and then as he was coming back, uh, we were getting set up for our, for our strike. Uh, and then we were able to hang out a little bit longer. And then I left him on station for me to go to the tanker. So it, it was a while. Holy so. cow. It's, it's the wheels of administration. That's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so, uh, it's average sortie, uh, in combat for you guys. How long was that from, from, uh, well, just for uh, our purposes here, from the time you briefed until you got back and debriefed, what what kind of day are we talking? Uh, the sort most of the sorties over in Iraq uh, were about seven hours. I would say uh, I had a couple that were like nine to ten hours, just Ooh. depending on what's going on. Um, and then you know, but that'll the, flat your backside. Damn. <laughs> the, the briefing and the debriefing for those are definitely, they're, they're much different than the brief and debrief that we do stateside for training missions, you know, because you, just cause they are, you, you know, uh, so, um, your overall day though was, you know, it was probably about 10 to 12 hours though. I mean, so, but it's not, not terrible, but you know, if you're doing that, you know, four times a week, like it, it can get, yeah, <laughs> it, can, it can get tiring. Yeah. yeah. Where were you based when you were over there? Uh, based on, I was an LUD at Cutter okay. uh, for both of those deployments. I never did, never did the Afghanistan thing. Uh, so some guys did that. It was, that was a little bit different flying over there. Um, but all right. So did you volunteer for an exchange tour or did somebody come to you and say, you need to do this? 
How did that yeah. come about? I, I volunteered. I wanted, I wanted to do it. Nice. Nice. Um, so when I was on yeah. uh, the, my second deployment uh, in the Strike Eagle, we had a, uh, a female Wizzo in our squadron whose husband uh, was a uh, uh, F-18D Wizzo with the Marine Corps. Okay. And he was stationed up in um, – uh, where were they stationed up at? They were they were stationed somewhere up in Iraq, you know, operating out of there while we were okay. stationed down at, at IUD. And when the assignment cycle came out, you know, for here's the list of potential assignments. I think there was like an F-22 exchange or not exchange, an F-22 transition and then some other stuff. And then there was this thing, you know, it said F-18D uh, exchange program Marine Corps. I'm like, man, this sounds this sounds really cool, you know. Like it's doing the same mission I already really enjoy doing, um, you know, providing uh, the support to the guys on the ground and doing that stuff. And I knew that the Marines were doing a lot more of it than what we were doing, and they tended to be operating uh, under uh, not a different set of rules, but I would say more more flexible set of rules <laughs> than the Air Force guys were, you know. Yeah, I want to so, talk about that. So, yeah. so, I mean, so talking, talking to her and her husband, you know, and kind of, you know, getting a feel for that, it, uh, I was kind of like, yeah, I, I definitely want to do this. And I knew I could, uh, they are, they were also doing the FAC a mission. Uh, so the Ford, uh, air controller stuff. Yeah. And so yeah. I wanted, yeah. I wanted to do that. I thought that would be really cool. It's something the strike Eagle doesn't do. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I put it down as my first choice and, and it worked out. Okay, so you went Sweet. to where for F-18 training? So I went I went straight from Seymour out to uh, Miramar to okay. do the RAG. VMF-AT-101. Um, yeah, 101. Yeah. Uh, sharpshooters out there. Um, so I did that for a year. And initially, I didn't think I was going to do the carrier call stuff because I knew I was going to a D-model squadron, which the, the Marine Corps D-model squadrons, they don't, they don't go to the boat you know, when they deploy. Um, so I didn't know that that was going to happen, but it, you know, it was kind of cool to find out that, Hey, you know, we're going to go ahead and put you through this anyways. Um, so yeah, so I spent a year out there and then, and we can talk more about that in a second. But then, um, after that, I went over to, uh, Beaufort, South Carolina, uh, for VMFA, uh, 533 with the Hawks, uh, for okay. a two year nice. assignment with them. It's a, um, was, your experience at VMF AT 101, your first uh, experience being around uh, Navy Marines, Naval radiators. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, w w what I'm digging at is what was your, what, cause uh, you know, you alluded to it a little bit. Uh, what, what was your, uh, how, how can I say the impression? Well, the different impressions of what, what it was like to fly air force versus Navy. Uh, there's actually two of you sitting here tonight that have done both. Fig, Fig yeah. uh, finished up doing uh, air, air guard. Air guard. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I understand. You know, I started, you know, in the in the in the Marines, and then when I transitioned to Air Force rules, I was, you know, having been brought up one way, I was constantly frustrated at the at the uh, operating restrictions that were put on us in training. And I found it, I found it ironic that when we deployed to combat, everything was waived. Where, whereas, you know, the way we were brought up, you know, there was no restrictions. And when you went to combat, that's how you operated every day. It was a little different, full philosophical, I guess. <laughs> how, how, did you, how did you feel about that? Or, you know, how, what, what was your impression? What, did you think, holy shit, these guys are bunch of freaking cowboys or was it like okay i can i can oh, it was, i mean it was interesting because you know the air force is you know every, everything from pilot training all the you know through through your initial training a fighter squadron it's just very regimented you know you've got your set hours you've got you know this is going to happen this right. and like and this is the schedule like there's no like really deviating from that schedule you know um and then you show up there you know for 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 training with the hornet and it's like it, it's like typical naval training you know where you're kind of like oh well here's what you're supposed to do it's up to you to go do it you know and figure this out you know and no we don't have any class on this because you're supposed to go study on your own <laughs> type thing you know <laughs> um and then just the the way they manage the schedule to to everything else it, it is completely just so different from from how the air force is right air force manages stuff and and i mean i, I remember at one point 
Um, I'd gone, I'd gone, I think about three weeks without flying and, you know, but I didn't know who to talk to or whatever. And like, I finally, I'm like, all right, like this is enough. Like, and I've walked, you're not supposed to walk into the scheduling shop as a student, but I had a little bit more leeway being, you know, like not really a, a true student since I'd already yeah, right. you know, had operational experience. So I walk in there, I'm like, Hey, w- what's going on, man? Like I haven't flown, you know, in a couple of weeks, you know, it's been almost three weeks and they look they're like, well, we don't see your puck on the board. Well, somebody had knocked my stupid pucks off the board <laughs> and they were on the floor behind the, the dang refrigerator right. there. Puck, puck <laughs> on the board. Yeah. He's talking about what he's talking about is a magnetic yeah. thing yeah. with probably your name on it. Right. Yep. And, and so, uh, unlike the way we, we operate, you know, you in the air force, you knew what you were going to do two and a half weeks in three weeks in advance. Right. Yeah. I mean, they yep. schedule a month in advance. Yeah. Well, that's not the way we do it, as you know. I mean, we're we're doing good to figure out the next day. You yeah, know? F- fifteen sixteen hundred comes out tomorrow's uh, s- schedule. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a different. It's a whole different. Oh, and so uh, let me ask you this: When you were in uh, five thirty three VMFA AW five thirty three, yeah, did you have a side billet other than squadron yeah. pilot? What yeah. what was it? So I started off as the, uh, assistant opso. Um, so the assistant operations officer, uh, and then I went on to become the, uh, uh, the double double AMO or the, uh, the assistant aircraft maintenance officer. Yeah. Which, which a lot of the Marines were not happy about me getting that job. <laughs> yeah, well, really? it's, it's kind of a coveted, you know, it's kind of yeah. coveted yeah. job. Well, so that's different from, uh, air force fighter squadron, right? Yep. I mean, yeah, uh, so Air Force you guys did almost no maintenance in the squadron, right? Is that the, yeah, yeah. The air, maintenance is not in the squadron. Um, they're not, um, they're not integrated. They're separate, complete separate chain of command, you know, separate groups and, and all that stuff. Um, and so you don't really interact with them other than when you go down to, you know, to, to sign, to get the jet, you know, and then for your little bit of maintenance debrief, once you're done, here's what, here's what's wrong with it. You know, and right. guys will go down there and you, you do, you interact and it's really weird too. Cause like when you deploy in the air force, like all of a sudden they all become one unit underneath the, the squadron uh-huh. commander for the, 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 the flying squadron. Uh, but when you're back at home station, they're separate. So that was, that was probably the best experience that I had out of that exchange program was just, it, it taught me a whole lot more about leadership right. uh, and getting to work uh, with the maintainers and everything that they do, you know, stuff that, if, if I tried to do that in the air force, I would get looked at really weird. Cause, <laughs> right. yeah. you know, cause, cause that's not like, normal. That's just not normal to see somebody right. down there. You know, like if you ever saw like an air force officer out there doing a FOD walk, you know, it's like, what, what the heck's going on? <laughs> you know? Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, that, that was a, that was a really good part of the, that assignment yeah. and those jobs that I had. I, I got a lot more questions, but I think we need to uh, real, real pause. quick. Let's pause. Uh, FOD, FOD uh, is foreign object object damage, so we're looking yeah. for a screw, anything that may be on the ground that could suck get sucked up by a jet engine and there you go. cause a few million dollars worth of damage. So yeah. we had to walk around and look for that stuff. FOD walk. Yeah. So, yeah. Is this a good time to take a quick break? Repeat. Yeah, let's do that. Let's take a couple and a half minutes and uh, uh, point point our listeners to some people who are going to offer them a good deal and in turn are offering us a, a great deal. So we'll be back in two and a half. Ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seat belts and prepare for takeoff. Today's in-flight service includes a special feature. And no, I'm not talking about extra leg room. Better, amazing food. That's right, I'm talking about flying high with Factor. The meal service that delivers delicious, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals right to your hangar. I mean your home. You know, last week, my son and I were grounded at home with our stomachs in autopilot mode. No energy to go out and definitely no fuel left in the tank for cooking. Sounds like the perfect storm, right? But Factor was there to save us from declaring minimum fuel. We taxied right over to the fridge and picked out a gourmet meal for each of us. I had the chicken with an artichoke and spinach sauce. It took my taste buds to new altitudes. And my co-pilot, I mean my son, devoured a pork chop with a cheese and barbecue sauce that was simply out of this world. That's what I call first-class dining. And with Factor, you don't need to be a flight engineer to prepare your meals. It's all about two-minute meals. 
Fuel up fast with restaurant quality dishes that are ready to heat and eat from the refrigerator to the plate and ready to eat in under three minutes. And for those with early morning flights, Factors got your back with pancakes, smoothies, and more. It's a whole menu designed to keep you fueled and ready for whatever the day throws at you. And the best part? No prep, no mess. It's like having your own personal crew in the kitchen. Factor meals are ready to heat and eat, leaving you more time for pre-flight checks or just kicking back in the pilot's lounge. Plus, Factor is as flexible as your flight schedule. Order as much or as little as you need each week with the option to pause or reschedule deliveries anytime. It's the perfect solution for anyone who is always on the move. And speaking of being on the move, it's now time to get yourself on the move over to your computer. Visit factormeals.com slash so there I was 50 to get 50% off your first box. That's right, half off. Head to factormeals.com slash so there I was 50 and use the code so there I was 50 to get 50% off. That's code so there I was 50 at factormeals.com slash so there I was 50 to get 50% off. So thank you to Factor for uh, sponsoring that. So uh, you you were out doing the Hornet training. I think this is about as good a time as any to circle back to that uh, intro story yes, because yes. I can't think yeah. of a more terrifying place on the planet to be than on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier, especially on your own if you haven't spent any time time out there yeah I, I, what led up to this first of all did they say hey hoover <laughs> would you like to be carrier called or did they just say hey you're going to the boat bro uh, that- this, this is a part of the program man i, I got the full the full enchilada from, uh, <laughs> from the training you know you can't you can't get away from that <laughs> uh, well this is unique because uh, you know as you know uh, your your peers uh you know or everybody that was with you going through training had been there already Yep. Right. And probably the T forty five Goshawk at that point. Yeah. And yeah, so you they, they'd, they'd all been there before. And so 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 I will back up the story a little bit, you know, because you know, you gotta get on the boat somehow, right? And sure. so they give you the opportunity, you know, to say, Okay, well, half the class is gonna fly the jets out there and the other half, you know, you're just gonna walk on uh when it's in port here. Well, I I got into that group of you're gonna be the the half that gets to walk on, right? And, and right. I've never been on freaking carrier before so i have no idea how this thing works right <laughs> big great boat <laughs> but a bunch of bunch of the instructors from 101 they were going out for some drinks at one of the bars there in coronado uh, coronado they said uh hey you know why don't you come with us you know have some drinks and then and then we'll let us all walk on you know together at, at the end of the evening you know once we know when we're all ready to go yeah. So I grabbed one of the other students in the class. I said, you're going to be my DD because <laughs> none of the other students were invited to go hang out with the instructors. <laughs> right? No. I said, I said, you, Hey, come with me as a buddy of mine, you know? So we go ha- hang out and, and we're having drinks and stuff. And, and I started, I'm like, so what time do we need to be there? And they're like, don't worry about it, man. As long as you're on before it leaves port, you're good. You know, like you just uh, don't worry about it. And meanwhile, they are setting you up. <laughs> well, I, I knew I was probably okay because they were still there with me. Right. Okay. So I'm like, Fair as enough. long as the instructors haven't left, I'm probably safe. But in the meantime, my buddy, he's like, dude, we got to get out of here, man. We got to, we got to go. And eventually I am, you know, had way too many uh, adult beverages. Sure. And so we, we make our way down to the port there and, you know, <laughs> My buddy's trying to explain to me, okay, here's what's going to happen. You're going to walk up and there's going to be these sailors there and you're going to do this and that. And and trying to explain that number one to an air force guy, but to an air force guy that's drunk (laughs) was, was not like a good idea. (laughs) And so we, as we're going up to the top, you know, of, of, of the, what's it called? The gangplank or whatever. We get up to the top of that thing. And sure enough, there's a little table there. And, and some and some sailors sitting there, and then there's this old guy in some PT shorts with like a, a, a navy sweatshirt on, standing off to the corner. And as we get this up to the top, guy. he's like, "You two, come over here." I'm like, "Who is this old guy?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> so so we, we we walk over there, and he looks at us, and he's 
and he starts yelling. He said, do you know what time it is? And my buddy, he's just, you know, standing in strict attention. And like, and I, I like look at my watch and I was like, honestly, I can't even read my watch right now. I have no <laughs> idea what time it is. <laughs> and then he looks at me and he's like, what did you just say to me? I said, I said, I can't read my watch, <laughs> sir. <laughs> he's like, sir, you're, you're GD right, sir. I'm the GD cag of this ship. <laughs> and like, oh, shit. He starts going off and about, you know, all this stuff. And, <laughs> And, and and my buddy is just like you can tell he's just like I can't believe this is happening. And as, as the middle of the guy's like standing like right there, you know, six inches from my face, screaming at me, like I raised my hand, <laughs> and I and he's like, "What? What are you doing?" I was like, hey, "Can I just interrupt for a second? <laughs> I, I'm an Air Force guy. I don't know what's going on here, <laughs> but my buddy said we just need to be on the boat." Before it and leaves. I'm just, I just want to get through all this <laughs> you know, something to that effect. And he looks at us and he looks at my buddy and you could tell he was trying so hard not to start laughing. And he looks at my buddy. He's like, get him to his room. And I don't want to see you two again. <laughs> we, uh, and then uh, <laughs> that was, that was my, my, my story for getting on the boat. And the, uh, the, the funny enough though, the instructors, they were about, you know, 30 minutes behind us. Oh <laughs> they, shit. They did not get the, the same treatment that I got. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but, um, that's rich. Yeah. So we, we get there <laughs> beautiful. and, uh, you know, and then, so now I'm, I'm sleeping it off, you know, and, and next day, I think it was the next day there was no flying. It was, you know, they were still going where they needed to or whatever, or I wasn't, I wasn't on the board or something. But then it comes my day to fly. And, you know, like you said, I've, I've never been on a carrier deck before, let, let alone one out at sea. And so I have no idea what's going on. And, and I got, you know, down in the ready room and they're like, all right, here's your side number, which is, you know, the, the, the tail number of the, the jet you're flying, you know, and, uh, here, here you go. Here's what you're supposed to do. You're going to, you know, and the standard routine was you're going to take off and you come back around, you know, you do your trap and then you launch again, you keep doing that. And, get as many cycles as you can in. Right. Um, and I'm like, wasn't there going to be like an instructor with me or something for my first time? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they're like, no, like, no. what do you need an instructor for us? What we've been doing, you know, CQ practice, our, our field landing stuff, you know, for the right. past month, <laughs> you right. know, I'm like, well, how am I supposed to like know not where to walk and not walk on the deck and stuff? They're like, well, just grab one of the, I think it was the, I don't even remember which color they are, the brown shirts or, you know. Gra brown grab, shirt or a green shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Grab, oh, grab one of the brown man. shirts and t tell them where you're going. He'll make sure you don't die out there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I I crack open the door, the, the deck there, and I take a step out, you know, and the, the boat's moving, you know, and you're like. Right. And you, get the, you got the wind rush, and then all of a sudden there's a jet that lands right in front of you. And I'm just Whoa. like. Holy crap. Like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> you right? know, like, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. And so sure enough, like, all right, let me find somebody that can help me make sure I don't run into anything and kill myself out here. And they got me over the jet, but that, that whole experience, you know, from that. And, and I still, you know, I, yeah, I remember almost all of it, you know, just sitting there trying to go through your normal startup sequence and pre-flight checks and all that stuff. And, you know, and, and jets landing right in front of you and you're just like, what the heck is going on? And it's so, okay, like I got to get back in my rhythm, do, do my checklist, do what I'm supposed to do, you know, and then you get out there and then when you pull onto the cat, you know, for, for those that don't know you, they've got like a, a whiteboard that they should, they hold up with like a weight, right? So what, right, whatever, right. They, whatever they think your, your fuel weight is so they can set the cat to the right uh, power setting or, or whatever right. the right yeah. technology is there, right? right? Put you Set off, you off right with speed. enough steam. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're supposed to look down at that, compare it to, you know, your aircraft fuel load and weight and, you know, you tell them up or down or whatever. And I just remember looking at the board and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I just give a big thumbs up. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, shit. We're, we're good, man. Like, I don't, I don't know. And I'm sure, you know, for, for the students is probably all set to be super conservative anyways, oh, you know? You bet. Yeah. And so, and so then you sit there and you do all, you know, you run up the, to full, uh, run up to full afterburner and you're sitting there and I've got my hand on the towel rack and I'm like, okay, I've saluted them. 
And now I'm like sitting here, I'm like, and it felt like forever, you know, mm-hmm. um, the first time you do something like that, you're just sitting there going like, this is something's wrong. Cause we're not going anywhere yet, you know? And then all of a sudden it, it kicks and that is like, you know, an experience you will never forget if you, you know, yeah. once you, once you do it. Um, and, uh, I just remember, you know, Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 I'm going and we get, you know, get airborne there and my air force habits immediately kick in. Cause as soon as I got airborne, what's the first thing I did? I raised the gear, <laughs> you know? Yep. Yeah. And, and then I'm like, wait a minute. No, I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> so put the gear back down, you know, turn back into the, into the, the, the down one there to, to bring it back around and I land. And then you land, you know, you trap, you know, I trap on the first try. Like, okay. all right. Like, okay. Okay. I, I lived. Okay, I got to do it again now. <laughs> okay. I live. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> now I got to do it again. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, so, so it's uh, what is it? 10, 10 day traps and six night traps. I think yeah. it was. Yeah. So did, did you do it all in one shot? Or the day traps? No, no, no. I think it was we we did it two days because you know they they do that thing where you know you've got to you've got to wait for the helicopter to land and you know oh, uh, yeah. refuel sure. while yeah. in yeah. the middle of the cycle there or whatever. Yeah. And so um, that's which, which hey, boat was it? I was getting ready to ask that. What ship? Yeah. The the Lincoln, if I remember correctly. Okay. 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 Um, you said uh, I I need to get uh, clarification on something. I know what you're talking about. However. Uh, yeah. Or some of our listeners won't. You said hand on the towel rack. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's, so they tell you, you know, when, when you're, when you're taking off on the, on the cat, you're not supposed to um, have your, you know, you're not supposed to hold on to the, uh, the control stick there, you know, uh, because they don't want you, you know, a reflex, you know, they don't want you to pull back on the control stick or, or whatever, or basically react to, to what's happening. So, so the trim is all set for, for takeoff. To where, you know, if, if you're not touching the control stick, you've got the left hand, you know, up uh, in afterburner and the right hand is grabbing, you know, it's, they call it a towel rack, but it's basically just a, a, a handle there. I guess you can, I've never, I never flew with a towel, but you could always, some guys. Do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a handle. It's a yeah. handle like up on the canopy bow, right? Yeah. Yeah. Up on the canopy yeah. bow and, and you leave your handle there uh, and then your hands off and as soon as it launches, you know, it, it because of the way the trim is set and the configuration of the aircraft, you climb away at a a certain pitch angle, you know, and then, okay, like now it's stabilized. Now I've reached down and then you take over the controls and go from there. Now, right. I'm going to say something. Uh, uh, well, I saw, I saw it go through the, uh, some of our live chats going on here, but you know, you, you should, you should wear wings of gold, you know, after that, (laughs) because you know, you, you, you did it. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. That's it. Yeah, that's naval I'm, aviation. I'm, I'm very impressed, Hoover. That's that's a great story. But but the fact that you that know is, you didn't go to the boat as a student, you know, like we all did, and and now you're just being thrown into this thing. It's uh, it's impressive. Well, well, like I said, I mean, that was that was. One yeah, of you're the kind of expected to know it. <laughs> well, that was that was one of the big differences between you know how the Air Force does things and the way the Navy Marine Corps does stuff. And I mean, the Air Force never would have done that. You know, they would have said, okay, we recognize you haven't been to the carrier ever. <laughs> so we're at least going to put, yeah. you know, instructor Wizzo or somebody in your back seat to make sure you don't kill yourself on the, <laughs> you know, on the first flight. But the, uh, the Navy Marine Corps is just, just a little bit different in the way they do things. And that that's okay too, you know? Yeah. So it, it definitely right. builds, builds a lot of confidence when, when you do it that oh, way. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. All right. Well, that's, that's the other thing that you said was interesting was, uh, yeah, something you'll ne- you do something like that. It's something you'll never forget. It, you know, if you hadn't experienced it before. And I still, geez, forty years later now, almost uh, at least thirty five. Remember my very first cat shot. It was in a T two off the Lexington, and yeah. between yeah. the excitement of the moment and the air being forced out of my lungs, I was at the. I was doing this high pitched, <laughs> <laughs> like a six year old girl coming off of there. That was such a hoot, and I think I would say four Gs easily straight back as that yeah, thing yeah. shooting you down range. Well, the Lexington yeah. had such a. And short And then I cat thought stroke. my engines had quit. Yeah, the Lex was a shorter cat stroke, 
But uh, and then when I came off, it was relatively speaking so much quieter. I had to physically look down at my engine gauges and make sure I hadn't lost my engines. <laughs> I thought, oh, they quit, <laughs> and the relative acceleration was so much less. It almost felt like I was being thrown forward. And it was like, oh no, they're still running. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> so, but yeah, that well, was nuts. I'm I'm very impressed. Good on that, you. Hoover. So you uh, you show yeah. up at um, in Beaufort. At uh, VMFA AW five thirty three, and mm-hmm. uh, did you guys deploy while you were there? Did you? We deploy? did. Uh, we did one Westpac uh, during oh, the two years that I was there. So, okay. uh, for those that don't know, Westpac is the uh, you know we go out to uh, Iwakuni and Japan, where you're you know mm-hmm. you kind of land based out of there, and then while we're at Iwakuni you hop around to some of the different spots over there. So we went to Thailand and Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Korea, and did all that stuff, you know, a couple weeks here and there at a time. So did you guys get that, down that, to Darwin? That, that was, that was definitely a, a different experience too. So did you get to Darwin while you were in? Uh, no, no. Okay. Did you go down? Did you, did you say Kadena? Did you guys go yep. down and operate yep. at Kadena a little bit? We did. We did good. We did. That's about as far as, I guess, I don't know if that's further south than Singapore, but that's, <laughs> yeah, but, that, but we, yeah. we did go down there. All right. What, and, uh, what would you say, um, oh, I'm sorry, Fig, were you going to stay on that line of questioning for a second? Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, well, I've, I'm kind of curious as to what your impressions are uh, about the two different airplanes, the Eagle and the Hornet. Uh, oh, obviously, yeah two different missions and that sort of thing. But I'm wondering if you, uh, have, uh, you know, is it, uh, obviously is one, one, your favorite over the other. Um, I think I know what your answer will be and I think I understand why, but I, but they're such different airplanes, somewhat similar missions. Did you find one easier to fly one more rewarding to fly? Uh, can you talk about that for us a little bit? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I really, I, I have to say, like, I really enjoyed flying the strike Eagle more. Um, but only because of, you know, th- the way they employ that aircraft, uh, and because of its capability, you know, it just enables okay. it to do a, a whole different mission set, um, or at least, a, a much, much longer missions and more, more complex stuff than, than what the Hornet mm-hmm. is capable of. Cause it's just got s- such short legs with its fuel capacity and the, um, uh, and the limited amount of ordnance that you can carry on it compared to a strike Eagle. Um, right. And so the, the one thing that I, I really liked about the Hornet was I really enjoyed doing all the fat gay stuff, being able to, to control, you know, um, close air support missions from the air, from the cockpit, you know, and working directly with the ground forces, uh, and having that capability. Cause that is, that is something that the, um, the air force doesn't do in the strike Eagle, the a tens, uh, do that. And I know some of the F 16 squadrons, right. uh, have the fat a, uh, qualification, but the strike Eagle doesn't. Um, and I really enjoyed the Hornet. The Hornet was a fun jet to fly, uh, especially doing like slow flight BFM, uh, one, one-on-one, you know, dog fights, you know, in close quarters, uh, just because of the mm-hmm. nose authority and the high AOA maneuverability of the aircraft. Uh, it was really, really neat to fly that thing because the strike eagles uh you know you, you take the c model eagle and then you slap on the conformal fuel tanks you know and, and then you slap on some external uh wing tanks it's just not really made for <laughs> yeah know, for, for dog fighting uh, <laughs> right like that you know um so i i liked both of them but in general just the I felt for like, different reasons yeah for, for different reasons yeah. though but, yeah. but you know you, you always you know well yeah she, you always like your first girlfriend yeah, you, you know first, always first true love yeah, yeah that's so, right there's I that i felt like i was asking asking you know which child is your favorite i get it yeah it's hard it's hard to say <laughs> but he did he, he had a favorite yeah. and i get it yeah. i mean totally. yeah well, I mean, that's really cool that you got that experience. That's uh, it's rare. I don't know what percentage of, you know, uh, I, I know. Well, I know a lot of Harrier guys, and only like three that I can think of did an exchange tour, uh, and you know, so it's pretty rare. I don't know if it, you know everybody really knows that, but getting to be an ex- do an exchange with another service or go to another um, country's service and do an exchange is is pretty rare. It's a unique opportunity. 
I'm glad you yeah, guys we, did that. We have, um, I, I know down at Buford, it was typically, you know, they'd only have one Air Force guy there at a time. So, you know, when I left, I got replaced with another Air Force guy. And, you know, you're you're competing with all the other uh, fighter platforms too. So there's, you know, Strike Eagle guys, A-10 guys, and, uh, you know, C-model guys, all, all that stuff that, that want to do those types of things. It's, um, those they're interesting assignments because they're really, good for, you know, a lot of fun, you know, I think for, for the pilot, uh, in terms of career development and putting you on a specific track for like different leadership opportunities, things like that with the air force, like they're not really so much good for that. Um, because they kind of take you out of the air force chain of command and out of the air force cycle for, for a three year period. And so you're kind of forgotten a little bit, you know, by the community during that time you know, and so you're trying to yeah. kind of work, work your way back into things when you go back. Um, but you know, that, that's a whole nother discussion on officer development and you know, what we should really be doing. <laughs> now, just to clarify, uh, there was one air force exchange pilot at Buford period or per squadron. What, one at Buford. I was the that's, only air force guy on the base. So that's what I thought you were going to say. Yeah. That's pretty unique. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So now, it is, I, it, it was, it was weird, you know, cause you're walking around lo uniform looks a little bit different than everybody else's, you know, and then right. you've got, you've got the blue hat, you know, versus everybody else's green or tan hats, you know, depending on Navy Marine Corps, you know? Right. Uh, so now who, uh, this is administrative and, and it really doesn't matter. Uh, uh, but, but who, uh, who, who does your OPR while you're, I mean, were, <laughs> was it the Marines signing so it or was there an air force, uh, <clears throat> I mean, how so that, that, work? that that's part of the crappy part, depending on how long the exchange program has been going, like, um, some are more successful at doing this than others. But for the program that I was in down at Buford, I wrote my own performance report, okay. which having no experience really writing those reports at that point, uh, I thought I was writing like really awesome reports, <laughs> but, you know, and of course the Marine Corps, they just sign off on them. Right. You know, sure. Yeah. And then the air force is like, eh, you know, like, okay, now it's a part of my permanent record, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and I'd find out, you know, three years later that like, I, I should have written those a little bit better if I wanted, you know, certain opportunities and things like that. Um, doesn't walk on water every day, only six days a week, you know, yeah, that's yeah, right. that, wait a minute. Right. What did you do wrong? Why weren't you walking on water seven days a week? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, because how, how the the Air Force does all those compared to how the, the the Navy and the Marine Corps handle performance reports is just completely different system and styles sure. of writing and what they're looking for and stuff like that too. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I, how'd you get? Uh, so you have a YouTube channel, Pilot Debrief. Uh, yeah. If folks, this is a fun channel to go learn about some really cool things in aviation. Uh, you cover a lot of really tough stories and you do it with grace. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I know it's got to be hard to hold your tongue sometimes and other times it's just got to be heartbreaking to see what you're doing. But how did you get into the uh, uh, doing the YouTube thing? Was it safety in the Air Force? Was it? Yeah, so I got um, I got started in, uh, down the safety path towards the end of my okay. career uh, in the Air Force. And then one of my last jobs in the Air Force was the wing chief of safety. So in that job, you know, you're responsible for overseeing all of the aviation safety on base, all of the occupational uh, safety. So all your OSHA compliance type stuff, um, okay. as well as uh, weapons safety. So basically any, anything that happens on that base, somebody gets injured, whether it's, you know, uh, running a plane into something or, um, you know, falling off a ladder, you know, trying to paint the side of a building, you know, you, you, you cover all that stuff with the investigation. So, so that's, that's how I got started in that process. Um, and I, I kind of liked it, you know, but I didn't, I didn't ever really think I would be doing something like that out, outside of the air force. <laughs> yeah. And, and then, you know, I started, you know, I would see, as I'm sure you guys do, you see like aviation mishaps in the news and stuff like that. And, you know, then you have friends and family that kind of ask you about those things. And what do yeah. you, what do you think happened? You know, and, mm. and, let's and then the misinformation around them is always astounding. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's then you'd start, you know, I, I can't remember which one it was, but I remember, you know, at one point reading one of the NTSB uh, final reports on, you know, some mishap that happened. And I remember reading it going like, 
really? Like, is that it? There's, there's gotta be more to this story, you know? And then, and that led me to discovering, you know, well, the NTSB has a whole other site that has the docket, which is all of the supporting documents for the investigation where they do the interviews and the analysis and everything else that doesn't make it into that final report. And then you start reading through some of that and you're like, well, holy crap, man. Like they, why didn't they talk about this? Or why didn't they talk about that? You know? And the other thing that was kind of frustrating to me was, you know, you, you'd read the story about a mishap and it would say, well, you know, the probable cause was the pilot exceeded the critical angle of attack and he stalled. And you're like, well, no crap. Like, yeah. <laughs> of course that's what happened. But like, how did he get to that point? Like, what did he do? that caused him, you know, to, to get to there. And then that's when you like, you go and it's maybe not in the final report, but you go back in the docket and you find out, well, this guy, like, you know, he wasn't even licensed to be, you know, wasn't even qualified to be flying the aircraft and he had lied about this or that. And, you know, and Oh, by the way, he didn't run any checklist, you know, and sometimes that stuff would make it into the final report, but a lot of times there's details that don't. And I've learned over the, the past year or so of doing this, that a lot of it's really dependent on, the person at the NTSB that's doing that investigation and the level of, of experience they have and whether mm-hmm. they include it or not. And so that's why I decided, you know, I, I said, all right, well, let's, let's start an aviation channel and let's, let's talk about some of these things. And it really started with, well, let's try to explain um, these different ATC events, right. Air traffic control um, where, you know, you have this, uh, the air traffic controllers, you know, recording of, of the conversation of the radio calls and stuff, you know, for an aircraft that's having an emergency situation. So I start off making some videos of, of, of those. And the, those are some of the earliest ones on my channel. And then it, it evolved into what it is today where, you know, I'm taking basically an, an NTSB investigation into something and then just doing a deep dive analysis. And really it's, it's trying to find compelling stories and share as many lessons as I can from those stories. Um, you know, cause one, you know, pilots appreciate them cause they know it makes them safer or student pilots learn from them. Uh, but I get a, also a lot of non, uh, non flyers watch the channel just because of the compelling nature of the story because there's a, there's a, there's a certain human element to it. And right. that was the other thing that I found was missing with a lot of aviation content is nobody ever really talks about the victims, <laughs> you know, of these things. Oh yeah. Um, and well, how, how did these four kids ended up, end up on this plane, you know, like yeah. they probably shouldn't have been, you know, and, and here's what happened. So that's uh, always the heartbreaking too. When you see that, it's like people that have no control over whether they were there or not. And you're like, yeah. Ah. Yep. So, no, it's it's amazing. Uh, I, I highly encourage anybody to go go look at Pilot Debrief on YouTube. Fantastic channel, some good stuff. So, yeah, my my uh, my YouTube shorts are. I, I try to those are end up being a little bit more lighthearted because <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's really just just talking about some of the stuff that I see in like you know a, a thirty to sixty second clip, you know. But it's it's the videos that the that do the deep dive type stuff, and I guess it, it's interesting because. You know, when I start doing the research, sure. you know, I can get a little emotional sometimes because you're reading, you know, maybe the cockpit voice recorder of everything that was said all the way up to the moment right. of impact. Yeah, that's you know, right. and that's really hard, especially when you know, like, everything that was done wrong that on that flight that they never should have been in that situation to begin with. Um, but it, I was telling my wife, it's 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 weird sometimes because I, I, I have to go through it so many times, either doing my research or doing the filming and the editing of the video they, by the time like I post that video, it's almost like, you know, it, it's a non, non event, if you will, for me uh, anymore. It's, it's lost its, its emotional significance, you know, to a certain right. degree, but then people start commenting on the video and all of a sudden you realize, oh, wow. Yeah, that's right. Like, you know, and you're, it's like, you're re going through it for the first time again, because these people are seeing it for the first time presented to them. So that's right. a, that's a lot of work. That's kind of a labor of love for you now, isn't it? Yeah, I I, I enjoy doing it. It's it's it, as sad as some of these are. It's, it I, I hesitate to say it's fun for me, but I do enjoy you know um, making that type of content and trying to simplify things and break it down. So well, you know, there's value in that. In that, as aviators, we we can learn from yeah. other people's mistakes. You know, and 
it, you're you're just pointing out some things, and you, you know there's non-aviators that are interested in this kind of thing, but but truly it's uh, you know it's valuable, and you yeah. know thanks for it's, doing that. But yeah. as they say, flight manuals are written in blood, right? So yep. uh, sadly, a lot of this is written in blood, and hopefully somebody can take that as a, take these all as uh, as learning points. So yeah. Well, uh, well, I. I, I want to say, first of all, Hoover, uh, it's been a pleasure. I, I, we've had you on here for an hour and 15 minutes, and it's gone. It seems like about 10 minutes to me. Right. I, I, could, I could listen to more stories forever, but I know you have a life. I want to say thank you for your service, sir, and I really enjoyed our visit. Yeah. Well, well thank you guys so much for, for reaching out to me and for the yeah. invite and, and for your service as well. Uh, I, I think you guys are doing an awesome job with, with the show. Uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. And uh yeah, I, I definitely could have talked for a lot longer <laughs> and more, plenty more stories to share. But <laughs> well, we'll so well, you got to come back then. So yeah, this is this we'll is what back. happens uh, always. Yeah. You you know, as soon as we stop recording uh, and you go to have a beer, you're going to think of seven things that you should have told us. So just write the bullets down, and we'll have you back. <laughs> is that cool? Absolutely. All right. Love to have you back. Yeah, so. we'll, yeah. we'll make we'll make a plan uh, for it. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we also we, need to. Uh, oh, go ahead, Fig. Well, I was going to say, uh, I want to say uh, a quick salute to all of our military veterans and their families who support, uh, who's the the families who support them in in their important mission. And I want to say right. thank you for everybody out there. And, indeed, the families go unrecognized more than anybody. Um, <clears throat> We also need to thank a couple other people. Thanks, of course, always goes out to Dave Hamilton over at Beckbeat Media, who uh, has a show, The Mac Geek Gab, The Business Brain, and The Gig Gab for musicians. And our advertising is handled by Backbeat Media, backbeatmedia.com. Thank you, Dave right. Hamilton. Indeed. Uh, we have a glossary, so if we have a term like FOD or FAC or Talk or tech or anything Dow, else that Dow we buy and we didn't get it in there. Yeah, <laughs> Dow Dow rack. Rack. Yeah, shoot us an email and we'll get in there. You can uh, go find that at so there was dot us slash glossary. And then uh, how would someone write to us, Fig, to ask us about something on there? Well, uh, if you want a, a proper answer, a, a a intelligent answer, you better address it to Sticks at <laughs> he's he's. Fig, he's funny. He's in the background. I can see him. Figs at fit. I'm sorry. Sticks at so there I was dot us. And you can also reach repeat at so there I was dot us and fig at so there I was dot us. However, if you want a really good answer, you should address Sticks because he is absolutely absolutely got a, a higher IQ than uh, both of us put together. Absolutely. One other thank you we need to get out there is to all our supporters uh, online at sotherewaves.us slash Patreon. All the people taking their hard-earned money that they're paying taxes on, it's put in their wallet, and they turn around and frivolously throw it at us. We don't know why, but we're grateful that you do. We are humbled by your support, and it helps Very us humble. keep these great guests coming to you every week. That's It's a big deal, and, and we're, we're honored. So thank you so much. Well, uh, where are we at here? Hey, rate us. Rate our show. Yeah. Give us uh, give us some feedback. Uh, if you've got actual feedback that's not five stars, tell us how we can get it to five stars. We're trainable. We're trainable. We're trainable. Yeah. For, for the most part. <laughs> Usually. Yeah. <laughs> so there I was, that U.S. slash rate. Yeah. So uh, watching tonight, I saw him there in the background, is uh, Brad Solcott at uh, – bdsaviationphotography.com. He lets us use a lot of his imagery. So, indeed, thank you to him for, for letting us uh, use some of those great photos. He takes some amazing shots, mostly down in the eastern Carolina area. Got some great Harrier shots, but other naval aviation photos, too. And I bet he even has a strike eagle or two in there somewhere. I'll bet he does. I want to say, yeah. hey, thanks to uh, Bago. Bago's in the background there somewhere. I don't think he's with us right now, but he's always back yeah. there doing stuff for us in the background. Thank Indeed. You, Bago. Indeed. Thanks for all his help, particularly over at uh, Facebook.com slash so there I was that US. He handles that page for us with, uh, with grace, and he's on there a lot more than I can be. So that's deeply appreciated. 
then uh, two last guys we need to say our thank yous to Fig. Uh, yes, sir. Well, their their music's playing in the background. There, those That's are the uh, two F sixteen pilots that make the Air Force sound good. The Dos okay. Gringos. Dos Gringos. Go listen to them. They have a great song, in fact, about Air Force pilots wanting to land on a carrier. Yeah. And our guest tonight did it. <laughs> he, he could probably, or a Hoover could probably relate to that song Actually, very take, well. Yeah, take it back. They want to take off from a carrier. Yeah, they, they don't, don't want, want to land. land. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a great song. But yeah, thank you to the Dos Gringos. Indeed. So, all right, everybody. It's been great being with you this week. We uh, appreciate all your love and support. And until next week, stay safe and check six. There I was, crossing the pond, and you could see that I wasn't exactly fond of all the shit I was wearing on that day. Now an F-16 is cramped enough, but it's even worse with all that stuff supposed to save your life. But we knew there was no way. Because when you're going down the North Atlantic, man, it's over. Hold on, what do you say? He said it's over. Okay, that's a lawsuit. And we're out. <laughs> All right. Perfect. All right, everybody. We're running, uh, obviously, uh, started late tonight, so we're running kind of late. We're going to say good night to everybody. Thank you for being with us. Take care. Be safe. And we'll, uh, we're recording Peace. again in two more days, I believe. Look for, the, look for the notification. Be well. See you.